there has developed a conventional wisdom of sorts about Latinx peoples and the criminal justice system that I think is absolutely right. The criminal justice system, working in tandem with many other systems, obviously including immigration and education, but many others still, and working in conjunction with networks of civic and private players of every imaginable sort, targets low income of color and immigrant communities, including Latinx communities, all the time. And when they target them, when they decide it is perfectly fine to pay attention to them in this way, they surveil, they stop, ask, frisk, they arrest, they deport, they charge, they settle, they find the right jury and they convict. They put into prison, they may put into prison and also send out of the country. And then in the name of reentry, they create a system of unbelievably nightmarish dead ends, most likely to lead people right back to where they came from or to even deeper existential despair. That's the truth, the whole truth, and anyone in denial ought to live elsewhere. But insofar as some of the same people claim that all this is new, I think they're wrong. With full appreciation of the incredible, the extraordinary power of technology, all the very same methods that we see prevalent today in 2019, all the same coordination between systems and with networks was true at least as early as my boyhood years in the 1950s of East LA. In the East LA of those years, already, the criminal justice system worked hand in hand with immigration and education systems, with networks of every imaginable sort, to target Mexicans and all the other people who lived with us Mexicans in what is known as unincorporated East LA. And in targeting us, right, they deemed, they regarded, and they treated Mexican or Mexicanness as criminal as deviant, as pathological, as dangerously threatening or threateningly dangerous, as fully genetically and culturally unequal, as less than human, as deserving of whatever we got and nothing more and nothing less. If anything, 2019 eerily reminds me of my boyhood, which you should realize that means at least three things. First, my generation largely failed. We meant to transform the world, and we failed. That's not for a moment to say that I think we aim too high, or that somehow we should have made moderate trade-offs left and right, none of that is true. That's not for a moment to say that there weren't people who put themselves on the line all the time, who died or got ruined in so many ways they could no longer live in healthy fashion, or that many others are still putting it on the line as much as they know is far less easy than they ever first imagined. But you should also know that if my generation failed, you're looking at someone who got his butt whipped a lot more than he's ever won. I must have the worst one loss record in the United States. Of the many, many challenges with others that I've tried to take on, most of the time, 
We just got our butts whipped. That was true across the United States, in other countries, all up and down the state of California, all over greater metropolitan LA, and right here in this university. That's just the way it is. But here's the third and maybe more unsettling fact that I don't expect you to agree with at all. By targeting in the 1950s, all the Mexicans and everybody else who thought it was perfectly fine to live with us, the criminal justice system in tandem with all these other players regarded us as an exception. There is no bigger label to hang on any group or groups than to call them an exception. Because in democratic practice and in democratic theory, what it means to be an exception is that you can use law however you want to treat them, really however you please, and that there will be virtually no effective accountability for all that you do to those people. So in that sense, I'm not describing the 1950s in East LA as somehow an aberration in United States history. I'm calling it the norm. And I'm not only calling it the norm, I'm saying to you that the capacity to target groups because we regard them as exceptions is built into constitutional democracies. It provides us the capacity to do as we will with those groups that we simply say deserve to be treated no better at any point in time in their lives. I don't expect you to agree with me, and I'm not actually here to convince you. But I am convinced, after more months of um, feeling, that the most important thing I can do in the tiny number of minutes that we'll be together is to give you some kind of inkling of what it was like to grow up in those 1950s, to be a boy in that East LA. I could do this about a lot of communities, right? I could do it about uh, Sherrod, Sacramento in the 1950s. Right? I could do it about what? Jennifer's uh, El Paso. I could do it about uh, the clients that Sherry now represents, probably from any number of places. I could do it about the places where people like Devin's dad, a Cubano, migrated. Some, of course, didn't come to the United States, but those that did are wildly more variegated, living in wildly different areas than we think of when we simply think of Cuban Miami. And about all those places, right, and about all the places I know ridiculously well, from East Harlem to East Palo Alto to all of San Diego and on and on, and do justice to what it's like to live in something like 1950s East LA. But I know 1950s East LA best, or maybe if I'm being more modest, uh, I knew it first. And it left impressions on me that have shaped everything I do, how I feel, how I think, when I'm running around just being me, when I'm partly running around being a feral me that I never show you, and when I'm running around being the supposedly professional me trying with others to do something that's half decent. I'm also focusing on East LA because it's astonishingly true that other than covering East LA from my generation forward, so think of it as the 1960s forward, East LA is remarkably neglected in scholarly and journalistic accounts. I'm not just guessing that. For something like the past six months, 
I had our wonderful librarians, and who could have more wonderful librarians, gather hundreds of books, even larger numbers of articles, reports, PhD dissertations, unpublished memoranda that come my way, all about the criminal justice system or all the related systems and networks, and all about Latinx people of every sort. And only the tiniest number pay careful attention to early East LA or early part of Latinx communities anywhere in the United States. If you richly wanted to find out about Boricua in New York, you'd have a harder time than you think finding great literature. But here's what's worse. There is really good literature. And yet in short time, no one ever seems to know it or certainly to cite it. And what they write demonstrates absolutely no knowledge of what may well be the things that were already true then that we're thinking of as new discoveries today. So the East LA I know, right? I don't know how many of you are from here, or even if you're from here, if you've ever been to East LA except on the line to go to Boyle Heights or something. So the East LA I know in 1950, think of traveling east. Which way should I take you? Traveling east on Olympic, on First, or what you now know as Cesar Chavez, which was in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Ave. So think of traveling east. As soon as you get over that river, that beautiful river of ours, <laughs> you're in my East LA. Right? That's my East LA. The great majority of East LA is unincorporated, with the exception of Boyle Heights, which is part of LA. Right? And it's found on that side by the city of Vernon, the city of commerce, both of which you should study. It's bound on the east side by Montebello and Monterey Park, both quite different in 1950 than they are today. And it's bound over here, uh, this is a rough guess, by the outer boundaries of the neighborhood that goes by the name of City Terrace. That's my East LA. Census data is incredibly difficult to come by. And the librarians, although I should have asked Sherrod, I didn't want to bother him, spent two weeks trying to construct it. So the best we knew then, right, good guess, is that in all those neighborhoods, and particularly the part where I lived, there was somewhere between 30 to 88 percent Mexicanos, right? But there were large numbers of African Americans, Jews, Japanese, Chinese, Armenians, and what we then called white Russians. It's our local talk. And together, we were the residents of East LA. And I must tell you that the targeting of East LA was not just of Mexicans, and it was obviously of African Americans and Japanese and Chinese who had already been regarded as an exception. It was obviously true even of the middle class Jews who were still regarded as an exception. But as we used to laugh about locally, all the Armenians and blonde Russians got treated just like us. Because everybody figured if they were stupid enough to live with us, they deserved to be treated just like us. And that is flat out truth. Check the prison records. So here are three little phases that both memory and huge amounts of rereading of stuff in my family and of history makes me think are accurate enough memories to share with you. When I was really little, right, little, little, uh, at the beginning of the 1950s, I had absolutely no idea that everybody across the United States didn't look up and see really dark gray skies. I thought dark gray skies were everywhere. And I thought that the soot that we breathed in that was all over my clothes, especially if you were a kid like me who played all the time, was just what came out of the air, right? I had no idea that every place in the United States wasn't crisscrossed by freeways. And some new ones coming up, right? And that everybody said, isn't this great? You get immediate access to freeways. You can use your cars. <laughs> I had no idea, right, that all the rest of the United States didn't have such a preoccupation with cars. There were cars everywhere. 
in East L.A., outside East L.A., nothing was more fetishized in the 1950s or perhaps in 2019 than cars. And there were cars everywhere. And the crazy thing about the cars was that car registrations outnumbered the selling of vehicles, which themselves were the number one selling point in the United States, and gas consumption outdid DMV registration. I also had no idea, right, no idea that every place in the United States didn't have people up in your face all the time. Let's just talk about the L.A. County Sheriff, right, because officially they're in charge of East L.A. L.A. County Sheriff, so far as I knew, were patrolling all our streets each and every day. Right? That's all they did. Patrol, 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 patrol. But here's also what I thought was natural, right? They often drove right onto the school grounds. Not for a special day, right? Not like, you know, the celebration of whatever special holiday, right? Just drove up, got out. They also drove up into every park's grass. Drove up, got out. Asked the stupidest questions you could ever imagine. <laughs> Expected people to behave. Then went off as if the whole encounter was normal. And I figured, well, this must be normal, right? Everywhere across the country must have people up in your face because that's what it must mean to have, like, cops on the beat on their job. I had no idea, right, that not everybody had a mom and dad like mine who made you feel at home in the midst of what later I was to understand is madness. Loved, secure, and capable of doing anything you damn well pleased. Not just in East LA, but anywhere across the world. And they did all that, right, in a tiny, tiny, tiny two-bedroom rented home on Eastman Avenue between Olympic and Union Pacific. When both sets of grandparents were living with us, when my older brothers, pals who were something to behold were crashing with us and when all kinds of people coming up from mexico came and stayed because they were depending upon my mom and dad to help them get work commit permits and to figure out some spot to go land we were something of a safe house and i thought all places were safe houses and that all people felt just as loved as i did between the ages of uh, five and eight, a lot of things clicked. And they seem both young and arbitrary to be those ages. But in my family and neighborhood's life, they're not so arbitrary. I realized that all those cops running around were simultaneously working with all the teachers with all the truant officers, with all the immigration authorities, and with everybody else to pay close attention to us. Mexicans and everybody with us were just targets. They thought they had to be in your face, or to use the term of the time, to roust us at every moment. And so we were rousted. And I knew why, increasingly. I knew we were rousted because they equated Mexicanness with criminality, right? It wasn't that you could be a criminal, is that you were a criminal, and it's just a question of how you were expressing it. And when you dovetail that with what became the more obvious notion that they regarded us as genetically and culturally inferior, I began to grasp what was up. I realized, too, that my big brother was in deep trouble. He was 10 years older than I was. Uh, he was already in a well-known street gang. He was already a heroin addict. And he was already in the criminal justice system. But that really wasn't the deepest reason 
he was in deep trouble. He was lost and hurt. and self-degrading in the extreme. All the people who we normally think of as helping young folks, right, beginning with teachers, perhaps with nurses, and everybody else fanning out, just mocked him for what he couldn't do. And then ordered him around, expecting him to behave, and then punished him in every imaginable way when he wouldn't. And rarely would he. As much as I utterly loved and admired him, he was absolutely and remains one of my heroes. One of the things that I had to decide early, what I was not going to glamorize, either my brother or his pals, the pachucas and the pachucas of that generation, right? If any of you, and I don't know, have ever, like me, lived with a heroin addict who ran in gangs, who sometimes were inside your house and sometimes took you out on the streets with them, you would not romanticize heroin-addicted pachuco gang life. At the same time, at the same time, I understood completely how what they were doing, how they were dressing, was in no sense just acting out because they were punks or just an aspect of not having a prefrontal lobex well enough developed to behave differently. They were standing their ground in their own peculiar way and say, to hell with you. We count, we're equal. You can't treat us this way, and we can hold you accountable. So you can call my brother and the pachucas and the pachucos of that generation reckless. In fact, you can call them all kinds of names. Maybe not to my face, but go ahead. But the one thing you ought not risk, like some arrogant folks have, including Nobel laureates, is to imagine that they weren't simultaneously challenging injustice, because they were. It was at eight that I realized my brother really couldn't read or write or spell. But it was a crazy way in which that thunderbolt struck. I had just finished second grade in the little elementary school right next door to our house, where my brother had been to school. 10 years earlier. And as I finished second grade, looking forward to playing day and night, because that's what I did, my, brother, my mom told me, uh, you're learning how to read and write and spell this summer. And I remember my response. Me? Read, write, and spell? I had no idea at that point in time, having finished second grade at eight, that I didn't know how to read, write, and spell. My teachers had never talked about it. They'd never talked about that was coming up. And I just figured I was on the right course. I always thought I was on the right course. <laughs> Whatever I did, that was going to work. Uh, uh, and those of you who know me know that that's the way I feel. Uh, and when my mom told me that, I said, what? And so beginning as soon as school let out, She'd come home after putting in her full eight hours on the wage labor job, make dinner, get our help in cleaning up, and sit me down to teach me to read and write and spell. She had no formal training as a teacher, and she had one damn mediocre education through high school at a hardcore Arizona mining town. But she taught me. And I was thrilled when, at the end of July, she said, you're ready. We're through. From my point of view, it was just like, I had August to play, right? <laughs> but from that point forward, right, whenever I thought about my brother's inability to read and write and spell, I thought about it differently. 
And when I back, went back to school, right, I thought about where we were, all of us kids in East LA, getting the kind of education that we got where I didn't even know I couldn't read or write or spell. And to some of you who know me well, no is true. To this day, no matter what the school is, I always ask, what are we doing in school? I realized what became enormously confounding. That at eight, even with my mom and dad, and even for kids who had people like my mom and dad as their guardians, that my mom and dad and none of these wonderful guardians could ever offer us any assurance that for all that they loved us and tried to make us secure, that anything would necessarily go right. There's none of this business like, oh, you had your act together and he didn't, right? It is all pervaded by luck, luck of every sort. And never kid yourself or others to imagine we're here and other people are elsewhere because we're so obviously superior as opposed to so wildly much more lucky. In 9, 10, and kind of swooping forward into early teenage years, some things further crystallized. <clears throat> I realized that no matter what we did, Everybody was insistent upon the notion that we deserve the treatment we got and that no one should be held accountable. But here was the weird flip, right? When you think about the notion of that kind of treatment, particularly in the United States, what you imagine and what my dad had taught me about was it has something to do with, well, there are those times where we treat people as exceptions, for example, when Roosevelt invoked the emergency powers to intern the Japanese, right? That's an emergency. They're an exception. And as horrific as every formal use of that kind of power has been by people at the top of the hierarchy, I actually think it gets authoritarianism dead wrong. Authoritarianism <laughs> wildly more prevalent because the way it works is through practices. And the way it works through practices is that no one has more sovereign power than the cop on the beat. The cop on the beat can determine your life that you think only President Roosevelt can. And they do it every day and literally in 1950s with no law, or as Devin through a scholarship teaches us today in 2019 with laws, almost never are they held accountable. So that the authoritarian regime within the constitutional democracy we lived in in East LA, and those targeted communities lived in throughout the United States, were authoritarian typically not because of some formal declaration of emergency power, but the fact that we have sovereigns on the street, left, right, and center, not least teachers, and that hell can often be imposed by the people at the bottom of the hierarchy in ways that we never formally confront. I realized too how much my mom and my dad had tried in their own dignified ways to call out every one of these acts of discretion. I'm not saying they didn't sometimes comply. And when they complied, they must have felt terrible, but it was most often to protect somebody else. But they tried to challenge cops, they tried to challenge prosecutors, they tried to challenge everyone. Of course, never once getting an answer, much less an answer that was satisfying about why discretion was being terribly exercised and dangerously imposed 
on everybody we knew in East LA and in other parts of Los Angeles. I also realized, right, that especially by the time he was locked up, cycling through a bunch of places, Soledad, San Quentin, Chino, to name some, that my brother in his own way challenged every illegitimate order. Now, if either cops on the street or prison guards bark at my brother, my brother barked back. And when in teens they decided to beat the shit out of him, my brother fought back. Which means, of course, he often was bloodied and mangled, but probably more importantly, he was in the hole most of the years he was in prison. He was in solitary confinement. At the end of the 1950s, in 1959, I remember that my parents, together with some other local activists in East LA, were putting together the pieces of what would become a major campaign to try to incorporate East LA into a city. They were convinced that if they tried to gain their own sovereignty, that the horrors and the tortures they had endured, as had everyone else with us, would somehow be alleviated and things might be better. And they put me to work, and I was happy to work, and I did whatever they said, and that was true for the next several years. But I must tell you what I never told them um, until my mom was much older, that they were thinking about incorporation, but I was thinking about secession. <laughs> I'm not joking, but here let me be very blunt. I was not part of those Chicanos that wanted Southern California to be part of Mexico. I never once thought then, and I do not think now, that there's any reason to hold the Mexican government in higher regard than the United States government. We're here because both have regarded us as subhuman. So when I say sovereignty, I know this is gonna sound stupid. I meant the nation of East LA. When someone asks me, where do you come from? And I'll say East LA, but they don't know how strongly I mean it. <laughs> I mean the sovereignty of East LA. It's not Atzlan, right? It's not part, of, it's the sovereignty of East LA. So this is like one story told by one person. I don't think it should be slighted by calling it an anecdote, which is what some hard data people are inclined to do. I know a lot. I'm telling it from boyhood, but I know a lot. On the other hand, it's one story from one cat, right? And there should be many stories told about East LA and every other targeted community that has ever existed in the United States and know you wouldn't discover that they were free from the methods of today, but likely subjected to precisely their parallel. And we should have many stories, and they should be offered with vying interpretations, some I might totally disagree with. But I would be in heaven, right? In heaven to know people paid attention. And there are two reasons at least. One is like, you know, when you don't pay attention to those kinds of things, you have to realize the degree to which you're kind of helping to cultivate a real disrespect, as if a people don't have a history, and as if that history doesn't teach you something. The other thing is, if you think of yourself as a thinker, much less an activist, it's dangerously threatening not to know what authoritarian regimes do. If you don't know how the Chinese were treated as immigrants, you cannot possibly begin to understand how the Japanese or more formally legal and illegal Mexicans were treated later. If you don't know the sequence of what it is African Americans went through pre-slavery, as slaves, as so-called free people, and coming out after the 1877 compromise, you can't understand how it may well be that de facto segregation is at least as ugly as de jure slavery. Other nations, and I could name them 
and tell you about them, have made a point of studying the United States history because they think we're the most brilliant country of all, of knowing how to handle those people we call exceptions. Their lawyers writing laws to handle exceptional populations within their sovereign domain look to the United States as the mentor. And we don't. So I wish my mom and dad and my brother had never left Mining Town, Arizona. One in Jerome, little tiny, tiny place. One in Prescott, which is really big now, but was really tiny. And that's a crazy thing to say you wish, right? Those were hard, scrabble, explicitly racist, rough places. But I am convinced today, and each of them was convinced, that it couldn't possibly have been as bad as East LA. And that they would have found not only more dignity, but more joy in life, even if the town or perhaps precisely because the town was so explicitly racist. And had I been there, right? like if I had to join them, I was born there, I was a small town Jerome kid, I, I'm sure I'd have figured out a way to be happy, I'm sure I'd have a way to figure out to be me, I'm what a, you know, I'd have been a happy boy from Jerome, Arizona, happy to have been, or maybe I would have just stayed, right, and I don't know, I would have uh, worked a ranch, coached girls and boys sports, or, uh, I don't know, sang in some stinky bar. And, and each of those would have brought me great joy. And maybe I would have combined them and been the most joyous human being you have ever met. But you know what? East LA was the greatest place on earth for me to grow up. In the foolish, selfish sense of knowing what I'm like and knowing what it taught me, I couldn't have been in a better place, right? It made me face things that most of us want to run from or deny. And it made me live on high alert just to cope. And to live on high alert if I was going to understand what in God's name is happening here and what in God's name, if anything, can we do. And strange as it may seem, I love living on high alert. So when we have um, university symposia like this, the principal aim most of the time is that the combination of people, all of the people in the room, will help us to learn things and to understand things, perhaps slightly better than we did before, perhaps gigantically more than we did before. And there are a few things I love as much as learning and his understanding. But I got to admit that when I'm at these events, I go to learn to understand, because I still mean like crazy, despite my one lost record, to transform the world, right? And when I think about those years in East LA, there are a bunch of riffs about what it would mean if you cared too or if you already have demonstrated that you care, that you're gonna give your all when you can to do what's possible to transform some little chunk, some little sector, some little relationship, or the whole damn world. So first of all, it means you gotta understand like, hey, when I go out and I'm working with those people, they're just a range of people. What it means to be fully equal, right, is to understand that East LA has as many screwed up people as geniuses just like anybody else, with a big, wide middle. That's equality. It's not the romantic notion that otherwise better supported, we, Latinx, would transcend it all. That's nuts. It's not only nuts, it leads to immediate disappointment and running when the people turn out to be not deserving. Secondly, if you're gonna fight with them, right, Fight shoulder to shoulder, like mean it. Stand up when nobody else will. Stand up even when you're gonna get your butt whipped. That's not always easy, we'll sometimes fail, but if we're committed to it, 
will sometimes succeed in ways that we never thought possible of ourselves. Third, you got to be willing to make enemies. In fact, you got to take joy <laughs> in making enemies. There's a famous, you know, phrase in Spanish that amounts to, you know, tell me who you hang with and I'll tell you who you are. Everybody thinks that's just about like, who am I tight with? <laughs> no, it's also, who's my enemy? Most of us don't find that very easy, but you better get used to it, at least if you plan on changing the world as opposed to simply spouting off. Next obvious little riff is like, you know, don't expect solidarity. I don't expect solidarity. I, I think you must think, well, he doesn't expect solidarity with, you know, the South Asians or, or Japanese or black folks, but I mean, come on. He must expect solidarity from Chicanos from East LA. No, I do not. I'm not seeking to achieve solidarity. I'm seeking to work really hard to do something really well and to be respected by virtue of doing it. You don't need to be my friend, much less give me the pound. Solidarity can happen, but don't go in expecting to achieve it. It's the wrong thing to seek, and it's the wrong way to work. But my dad and mom, my brother, I don't know if they heard all that. They might agree or might not. They're very different from each other. But I don't think they disagree with that, any of this, right? When I think of that 1950s East LA population and what it went through, when I think of every group I've ever worked with that's been targeted in that way, the thing that most comes to mind about who they are is that somewhere down deep, what they're most about is not that they can always live up to what they'd like to, not that they don't sometimes cave, but that occasionally and sometimes more than occasionally, they're willing by virtue of how they act, how they act with others, and sometimes literally what they say, to declare to the world, there is some shit I shall not take. There is some shit I shall not take. Thank you.